Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Laddy MP8. Um, with me is Christy McFarlane. Um, she's going to keep me right, make sure I say all the right things. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Adam Hannett, the head distiller, and uh, we're going to talk through. Uh, hopefully, you've all got your samples in front of you. Uh, we're going to uh, talk through and taste through uh, three Port Charlotte uh, single casks, which are going to be quite interesting. Um, I've uh, I've watched some of the reviews some of you guys have done online already, so I've got some notes. So thank you uh, for doing that. Um, so you yeah. didn't have to write your own anyway. <laughs> no, I didn't. I just just watched what everyone else had done. So yeah, say so thank you. Um, no, so it's quite good to to uh, be able to taste them, to be able to talk through uh, what we do. And the idea with the MP uh, kind of series is that we can really kind of focus on you know the details, you know the provenance, the barley, the cask, the maturation, all that kind of stuff. So quite interesting, and a few other things to uh, talk about as well. Um, of course, we really want this to be kind of interactive. So you know questions, all that kind of stuff. Fire them in. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, I'll let Christy answer most of them. <laughs> Great, <laughs> thanks. Going to throw um, me in at the deep end. Absolutely, first live absolutely. Tasting. You think this is the first one? Yeah. I was so nervous before the live feed that I sent a WhatsApp to the CEO with a little kiss on the end. Uh -huh, so I'll be so sacked on Monday. Yeah, first and last one. So Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good, so I think, yeah, hopefully we'll have some fun tonight. It's, it's, it's going to be very open, uh, lots of stuff to talk about. So, um, yeah, so uh, let's, let's get stuck in with the dram. You'll notice that we have three bottles. Um, we have four. You know, it's been a while since we've done this. Uh, yeah, we had to get all our fingers out to count the right glass there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I got that one wrong, but we've... Um, uh, well, actually, just as, as I mentioned there, we, we haven't done the MP series for uh, a live broadcast for a while. Um, the MP8 series, we, uh, we, we kind of bottled them at the beginning of 2018 with a, a view to do them pretty soon after. And <coughs> unfortunately, um, you know, well, uh, Carl Reavy, who is the head of communications, uh, he passed away at the beginning of 2018. So we, you know, we weren't going to be rushing into doing any of this kind of stuff when... Uh, after we just lost Carl, so um, so yeah, so that's why we haven't uh, done this for a while, and uh, we'll dedicate this to Carl, uh, to his memory, and hopefully we'll yeah, uh, ho hopefully it'll be worthy. To, yeah, exactly, and we'll manage to hold back the, the emotions. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, any instructions for this evening, Christy? Anything we need to think um, about? Just that if you're joining in from home, maybe go onto the Twitter page if you want to ask any questions or add any taste notes, opinions on things. We've got our lovely comms department to my right. So we've got Jane Carswell, who's covering off um, some of the comments. And we've got Robert McEachern, who we'll try to keep under control for the evening. <laughs> Got a microphone. He does have a microphone, <laughs> so we're all on tenterhooks for that. Absolutely. So uh, if you do hear any swearing, it was uh, yeah, we do apologise in yeah. advance for that. And if you can join in using the hashtag MP8 and hashtag We Are Isla. There you go. So now you have your instructions, so we know what we're doing. Um, so the MP8 is, of course, Port Charlotte liquid. So the reason we have four uh, drums in front of us, we're going to start with a little Port Charlotte 10-year-old um, to settle our nerves, uh, is yeah. for one reason, <laughs> but uh, really just so we can focus, we can talk about Port Charlotte. You know, we've, we've last year we've relaunched the, the range, we've given Port Charlotte, you know, a, a kind of a fresh perspective, given it its own um, uh, its own focus. I think, which is, is really really cool. Um, some new whiskies. We obviously have the ten year old as our core product. You know, Isla Barley's cast special. Some really really kind of really innovative, really cool stuff that's uh, coming out, and you know, the future. Um, of what we have with Port Charlotte is really, really exciting. So um, we're going to kick off with the Port Charlotte 10. So if anyone's sitting at home and they don't have one, we're going to wait, what, five, ten minutes so you can nip down to the off-license, <laughs> get a bottle, run back home and uh, open it with us. So talk amongst yourselves while we, while we do that. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're just going to have a little, little drive with the 10-year-old just to kind of uh, get our, our taste buds zoned in. Um, it's a good say. opportunity for anyone who missed out on the kits as well to join us with yeah, something absolutely. that they might be able to get at home or you can pop out and get one afterwards. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, great place to start, uh, the Port Charlotte 10. Um, to be honest, uh, of all the whiskies we make, this has got a real soft spot. I've got a real soft spot for this one. And I tend to find myself, most Fridays when I finish work and go home and get the kids to bed, uh, I have one. So um, in tradition, we'll have another one just now. But you know, losing that, uh, it's beautiful, it's soft, it's sweet, it's really, really fresh. You get that marine tang and the peach really, really not the, the big player there, which is, is lovely. So what we'll find with Port Charlotte, 40 ppm, heavily peated whiskey. The peat smoke is always kind of held in check by the other, like the balance in the whiskey, the other flavors that come through. So, plunging. 
Cheers. Start already. I have. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't sit with whiskey mm. in front of me and not drink it. It's There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> I talk <laughs> too much and forget to drink. Sounds so. counterproductive to what you're supposed <laughs> to be doing with it. <laughs> very true. Very true. Um, well, but beautiful flavour there. Um, so, what's the cask profile on this? So this um, is predominantly uh, first of all bourbon casks. So it's about uh, about 65% will be fresh bourbon casks. Um, a few second full bourbon casks in there as well. Just let the spirit come through a bit more. And then about 25% will be second fill uh, wine casks, which is really, really interesting. And over the years we've been working with wine casks, I, I found that the second time you fill, you get a lot more oak, a little less from the wine, mm. and you get this lovely balance. It's, it's a really, really interesting uh, kind of dynamic. So that second fill is really, really important. Lovely. Um, but yeah, so that's the 10 year old. Um, nice. Warmed up. That's like doing our stretches. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> doing before we really get into the, the rest <laughs> of the whiskey. Up. Um, so. Yeah, we'll start talking about some of the whiskies here. If you want to pour the first one, we're going to start with the um, cast number 1860, which is the 2011 in first fill bourbon. So, just do it by me. Thank you very much. So, this is a really interesting cask because it's, uh, I mean, it was bottled in uh, 2018, um, so it's six years old. And uh, as I kind of mentioned with the MP, <coughs> uh, MP tastings, th this isn't, I'm, I'm not, you know, bottling, you know, perfect whiskies that are ready, that they, they are kind of a moment in time, it's a work in progress, it's a point of discussion. Um, so it's quite interesting, you know, it's not, it's not something we would normally bottle, that's not the idea of the, of the MP series, it's about discussion. So mm. uh, we can really see at this stage of maturation, you know, how that spirit's developing, where the peat profile is, um, you know, the, the whole kind of story, where it's matured, how that affects it. Um, you know, the harvest as we listen to the tractors zipping by, you know, it's a nice day on Isla, so the combine harvesters have been out. Um, yeah, I get stuck behind them most of the time. Yeah. And yeah. driving to work, so straw bales. They, they, they're usually going pretty fast, though. You know, yeah, it wasn't down too to bad. Yeah. Not too bad for the day. Um, so, so, yeah, and, and the great thing about this is, again, these are all Isla, uh, Port Charlotte. So, all the barley for this was grown on the island in, uh, for the first one here in 2010, and for the next two in 2007. The barley was grown on the island, and um, you know that's a really special thing for us, you know, to be making whiskey with Isla Barley here. It's, it's kind of central to what we do. So, um, yeah, quite special to see it go from growing in a field where it's mm. right close to the distillery, and seeing the excitement at this time of year as people bring it in, yeah. and actually, well, it goes away again to go malting um, to Beards and Inverness, but when it comes back and it's bottled here, it's kind of like you've seen it from almost the whole way through the process. Yeah. It's quite, yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? It really is. I, I think it's, um, you know, when you, yeah, when you make your whiskey to have that provenance of where that whiskey's made, I think that's really interesting. If I look out my office window, I look across the fields where Ian McHale's growing barley and you can see it as the year goes on, as it goes from kind of green to a uh, nice kind of golden colour and then when you see the bales in the field. So, I mean, it's nice to be able to have that really close connection to it. Yeah, it's a bit bizarre. It's something that, like, having grown up on the island, I don't know if you noticed it, but I've worked in the ind industry before and I've never felt this kind of connection to mm. barley and agriculture before yeah. where you do actually look across the loch and you see the different changing colours in the season and it does kind of connect you to nature a little bit as it well. It does, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And I think that's a lovely thing. It's that connection, it's that cycle and year upon year, um, you know, it happens and watching when it happens and how the weather, you know, you're really focusing on the weather. Um, I mean, <laughs> you more than most. Uh, yeah, yeah, please I, let it rain. I don't please well, this, don't this let it This is the thing. It's, it's this balance of at the beginning of the uh, you know through the summer when it's quite warm and you kind of you really want the grain to keep production going. Yeah. You're praying for rain, and then at this time of year you're praying for no rain so the combines can get into the field. It's a really interesting thing because, I mean, I suppose when you think about it, you know, kind of practically, the the distillation this year half of it will be from barley grown in Isla. So in 2018 we had a really good year, and that makes up half of our production this year. If we have a bad year this year, you know what do we, it really kind of fluctuates what we or can have a big impact on, on our production level. So yeah, interesting. But it's mainly the rain you worry about, isn't yeah, it? It is, <laughs> it is absolutely. Yeah, there's never enough rain during the summer. You let um, the farmers worry about the rain for the barley. Yeah, you'll absolutely. worry about the production water. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I suppose yeah, as we talk about barley and all these things, I, I think the, the great thing about this is this connection to Isla. It's the it's it's really what. At the distillery we're all about, but we're specifically with Port Charlotte, we, we really want to focus on you know what makes an Isla whiskey and you know, how we how we think about that. So, um, so there's one of the reasons why we selected uh, three Isla barleys for this, you know, because Port Charlotte is, is you know we are Isla. This is about what we do at this distillery. 
and we can talk more about that. That can kind of be the theme of you know, what we talk about, um, I think. Well, he's given it all away already. I know, I know. May as well finish now. Well, that's <laughs> it. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, no, let's, let's focus in on this drama then um, and uh, have a little nose, have a little uh, look at it. I did have um, a little look for some tasty notes, so I'll start with some of them. Nice. Um, so, yeah, on the nose... And again, these are bottled at cash strength, so the strength on this one is 61.4%, so still really, really strong. It's natural, just from the cask, uh, literally into the, into the bottle. There's no uh, dilution or anything taking place there. So 61.4, and you can pick that up, you know, you get that, that um, you know, that kind of prickle, that kind of yeah, heat of the alcohol there, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's not at all aggressive, I must say that. It's really floral, it's quite light, it's gentle. And there's a, there's a note, if you leave this to, to open for kind of 10, 10 minutes or so, you'll start to get a really lovely peach note coming through. I almost forgot it was peated there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's peated. Well, mm. that's Do I even work here? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, the, uh, that's the interesting thing, though, that the, the peat there isn't the most dominant thing. Yeah, you, you don't know. get it so much in the nose. Not at all. Kind of Not a bit more all. of a reminder in the palate. Absolutely. Yeah, really soft. Get that honey, it's kind of... Just starting to come now, you get that peat that's kind of an ashy, dry peat. And then we have a taste. Sorry, I mm. raced ahead. Mm. Again, counterproductive to totally have it in fine. front of me. Totally fine, that's what it's here for, isn't it? But again, you can feel that heat. You feel it's got that presence on the palate, but there's nothing aggressive there again. It's just that, that heat from the high strength. You get the peat on the palate for sure. Mm. Yeah. How, how would you say that the, um, like, Obviously, we work a lot with barley and with quite um, what some might call a, a younger whiskey mm. um, to get more of those barley notes through. How do you think that works with the, the smoky peat of Port Sarda and the cereal notes for the barley? I think it works really nicely. And like you see, the cereal notes, you really get that, that lovely kind of porridgey um, mm. kind of barley note, that malted barley coming through there. I think it works really, really nicely because that, that sweetness and that smoke are a nice kind of contrast to each other. The smoke's almost a little bit bitter, it's dry, mm. and you get that lovely sweetness. It's a lovely balance there. And when we're distilling at Brickladdy, we're always going to get a, like a, a floral, uh, quite light spirit. And to have the peat smoke sitting in there, you know, it's not, it's not medicinal, it's not oily, it's dry. Um, to get that cereal, to get that fruit, I mean, that again, that's, that's why we're bottling young, so we get the, the influence of the, of the cereal. I mean, that's why, you know, we're, we're talking about really what we've got here, you know, the variety of barley, uh, whether it's Optic on that one, sorry, on uh, Oxbridge Republican on this one, uh, Optic or, or Oxbridge. You know, we want to really focus on that and understand how that, that flavour comes through, how that works with the peat. You know, most people say it doesn't really, you don't really have to worry about the bar barley because you're going to feed it. But how does the peat and the barley add up to the flavour? It's not just about the peat dominating everything else. Yeah, it's an interesting one for me because I want to bring it totally back to Bricladi and our, what we've got in the Bricladi range, but I would have always said that barley variety didn't make that much of a difference until I mm. tasted bear. Yeah. And then bear barley, which is the six row variety that we grow in Orkney, it just completely shot all of that out the water yeah. for me. So yeah, it's yeah. interesting how everything plays a part. It's Absolutely. certainly not 70% of the flavour comes from the cask, or certainly not when you're talking about yeah, these, yeah. these well whiskies. And, and th there you go, there's, a, there's a, a private example. Another reason of why we're doing this or tasting this, because people assume, you know, that again, like, that 70% uh, it comes from the cask. 25% um, of statistics are just made up on the spot. So. Oh, I thought it was 80. <laughs> it could oh, well, it is. It is now 80. <laughs> but it's interesting. Like, I mean, how could you? you every everything whiskey is so complex and so, um, you know, it's a product of so many different factors that you can't just put it down to the cask. You know, you can't just put it down to these things. So we we've got to think about the barley. We've got to think about, you know, that harvest, that vintage, and you know, being able to taste these whiskies. You really get to do that. You really get to yeah. focus on the stage of maturation we're at, you know, at the stage of bottling. To be, to be a bit provocative, it's because like I'm, it. I'm, it's like <laughs> I'm always <laughs> a bit provocative, do you think that might be a myth that is spread by an industry that wants you to think that barley doesn't make a difference? Absolutely. I, d I absolutely do. I mean... Leading question. <laughs> 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 One yeah, I thought yeah. of earlier. Um, so, yeah, the barley makes a huge, huge difference. And, you know, we've doing these tastings, we talk about this kind of thing all the time, where it's regional trials, bare barley, organic, you know, everything is we're doing is it with, with barley exploration, we're, we're seeing a difference in flavour. Um, you know, the vintage is, is, again, different, so that even if we're, you know, we're tasting Isla barley and bare barley and organic, at yep. least those three, if we taste them, they're all different. 
you know, even if you take the bare body and go back vintage to vintage, you know, yeah. you'll, you'll get a difference there as well. So we're yeah. exploring literally everything and finding that there is a uh, there's a difference of flavour, you know. And it's only time will tell to, to when we get onto this. Yeah, it's quite quite nuanced. It's quite mm. esoteric, isn't yeah. it? It's not yeah. necessarily something that everyone's going to sit down like we are and mm. enjoy of an evening, but certainly something that keeps us excited uh, and for sure. well, keeps it part of the project of why you want to work here and why yeah. you want to explore. For sure. I mean, just just to come back to the, you know your, your question there, like we've got to explore what it is we're actually doing. You know, if we just didn't, if we just thought it doesn't make any difference and just kept distilling barley and didn't care where it came from. You know, we're not we're not doing justice to you know this, this craft and this history of distillation we have here. So for us, it's it's really really the focus on on barley on exploration. That's why we do things like this, you know, so we can yeah. really get to the bottom of it and uh, and discuss. It's actually a quite an interesting point that you know we always talk about it. I think almost selfishly, like for us, it's a project that keeps us going. I think Dave Broom wrote an article quite recently on ScotchWhiskey.com about how you know, people at home actually have to want it. Mm. Like mm -hmm. when you're talking about terroir, people actually w have to want to drive that forward yeah. and think yeah. that it matters. Yeah. At least I hope that's what <laughs> he was talking about. Yeah, uh, for sure, for sure. And I think, yeah, the, the conversation there has got to be, you know, it's maybe not for everyone. And, and as we're doing all this, you know, the really important thing is that at the end of the day, the whiskey has to be delicious. Yeah. You know, and that, that's that so even if people don't <laughs> want to go to the depth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think, again, when you focus on the ingredients and how you make your whiskey and how you mature it, you know, that makes it better. Even if you don't buy into, you know, the fact that organic and bare and I love make a difference, you still enjoy the whiskey. That's important. Yeah, it is. But it's also a testament to the people who have followed us over the years, mm -hmm. you know, that they feel like they, they get it. And we're very grateful for that, that there are people out there who do take the time to sit down and do these kind of geeky mm. style tastings, because otherwise we could be shouting into a tunnel <laughs> <laughs> if nobody <laughs> listening. Yeah, I hope so Thank not. you at home. I hope we're not. Christy, um, well, we're on the slightly touchy subject, <laughs> oh but no. uh, we'll just go in deep right at the start. Can, I, can I make a disclaimer <laughs> at the beginning? So when we um, when we started a bit of a debate <coughs> last September on uh, what makes an Isle of Whiskey, which we'll, we'll come on to in a little minute, um, we had a very lively discussion online. So we had um, some people who were very behind us in what we did on Isla, and there was there were a few who were quite cynical and quite critical about what we're doing, which is brilliant. It, we're always open to opinion. So um, in a rather ill, perhaps, <laughs> devised <laughs> plan, we thought, why don't we invite the people who have been quite critical about what we have been doing? We sent them a kit at home and we invited them to come along and take part in the <laughs> debate. You didn't this tell evening. me that. No, I didn't. Right. Uh, just Again, didn't want to be sacked, but m right. Monday, P45. So um, there might be a bit of kind of discussion going on in, on Twitter. So Un Well, unsurprisingly, some so of them are the first back. questions that's come in, which is what you would expect and what we're looking for. So uh, Soren Krebs at, uh, at OCD Whiskey, who was uh, heavily involved in our discussion back mm -hmm. in September. So thanks for that, Soren. Um, I say thanks <laughs> for that, Soren. Um, so he's uh, asking while we're on this subject, um, if I've got your question right, Soren, I hope I have. Um, shouldn't the terroir term in whisky be more about traceability, which is extremely important, as there are too many variables uh, within the production process and maturation period, i.e. fermentation cut, and especially the individual casks and previous occupants, to, term to determine the original effects of the terroir once matured? Did he get all of that in 140 characters on Twitter? Oh, you can get 280 now. <laughs> uh, variety strain in barley is surely far more important for imparting any flavour. Did you get that? So essentially, I think, yeah. I think what you're saying is that um, <laughs> sure, um, surely the, tra sure the, 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 the terroir term of whiskey should be more about the traceability. Because yeah. when you get to the, through the production process, there's too many variables within that to uh, determine the original, the original of the effects of the terroir once the whiskey's matured. Sure, th there's, there's so many factors involved in, in creating that final spirit, of course. But, and yeah, the traceability of it's really important. Um, I think you know, when you think about actually you know, the process of fermentation and distillation, that, that will effectively concentrate the, the flavour you get from your terroir, the variety of barley. So the variety of barley you plant, where you plant it, its climate as it grows, um, it will develop you know, the flavour, it will develop the, the grain. You know? So when you then mash that grain and ferment it, you're working, you know, that, that's developing the flavour. You know? yep with the, the yeast, the yeast will work on that and develop specific flavours. As you then distill that, you concentrate it again. So fermentation and distillation is, is always one of the best ways to express terroir. 
So, and that, again, absolutely after that, the maturation, the cask, but the great thing about what we are doing is we are, we're tracking all that, we're paying attention to that and paying equal weight to it all. Um, I think what we find is that in the industry that it's really, it's a frustration for us when people will say that the barley variety doesn't matter and the terroir doesn't matter. You, know, you, can, you can use barley from wherever you like in the world, it doesn't matter, you're going to distill it, it's, you're going to change the flavour. I mean, that's, that's just wrong as far as I'm concerned and what we've done in tasting spirits, you know, um, at the new spirit stage before it's even in a cask, you're going to get different flavours and absolutely, you know, it's the, the traceability and understanding the variety of barley and, and again, maybe not focusing in the development of barley, not focusing on how much you can yield from it, but, but where, how that barley is suited to specific conditions, uh, specific place, specific soil. That's you know where we want to go. That's why we we do what we do with uh, with this. So, I think it's an interesting point because perhaps it's because you're the head distiller and you're on the production side and you've you know you've obviously started in the shop. You've been in the warehouse side. You've been in production, um, and now you're kind of overseeing a lot of it. But for me, it's a it's a philosophy thing. So it's not just about. Um, you know, concentrating flavours. For me, terroir was about certain principles that Mark and Simon came mm. and brought with them from the wine world. And I think um, Simon's always really good about saying it's a practical way of applying terroir. Like, we, we might not be able to trace every single thing in a single cask. Um, we, we might have releases that are whole bottlings that explore single vintage, single estate, single malt. But at the same time, it was about making decisions that did put us further towards traceability and provenance. So making declarations mm. like having 100% Scottish barley, um, having Isla Farmers start to grow for us in 2004. So for me, if somebody says terroir, I don't necessarily think of it in the same way as wine, where you're talking about the soil mm. and the variety and the interaction of the grape. I always think about it as the, the full response to your community to the place that you're growing up and living your connection to the seasons and yeah. weather and you know for me it's not about that tiny minute detail although obviously with things like this it can be interpreted that way mm. yeah i mean absolutely it is it is about the, f the philosophical side of it as well and, and um you know how you, you think about that but it's almost like there's a there's a duty of care to to do things on isla for isla uh, because we're doing it here you know so that that becomes part of terroir. i mean it's such a wide-ranging kind of uh, terminology, you know, it can mean so many different things like to so many different people, but, but like you say, working the way I do with it in, in production, the, the, there's a practical aspect of it, and uh, even if we weren't thinking about terroir, you know, you, um, somebody phoning in the shop there. So Hello. Somebody's going to make We're a live. Live. If, How if somebody's looking there? for a tour, you can, you, they'll be in tomorrow at 10 o'clock, okay, so, <laughs> um, so uh, I completely forgot where I was going with that, but uh, like the, the, pra terroir. Thank you. The, the practical aspect of, of, you know, focusing on terroir and, and understanding the flavours is that when you're distilling, you want to understand the ingredients that you're working with, you know, just, mm. just to have barley isn't enough, to understand where it comes from and how that shapes the flavour, you know, even if you didn't use the term terroir, we would still do what we do Terroir just encompasses kind of almost the whole philosophy, the whole practical yeah, aspect of it. For me, it's about connection. It's about the mm. connection to nature. It's about connection to who's growing for you. Yeah, it's yeah. about you know seeing it at the end of it, where even down to the contractors who take it away. Yeah. Actually, that might be a good opportunity to just like take a step back and look at what what actually makes an Isla whiskey. So mm -hmm. if we're talking yeah. about terroir and the local terroir of here, if you're talking about the whiskey making process, so you start with barley growing. You then head to malting. You then mill that. I've got it's like a quiz here. <laughs> you know, then you've got mashing, fermentation, distillation, maturation, <laughs> bottling. This shouldn't well be this done. difficult. I know. Wow. And I only used eight fingers. So um, out of that whole process, um, in order to be called an Isla whisky, according to the Scotch Whisky Association's regulations, 2009, I believe. <laughs> All you have to do to be called an Isla whisky is to be mashed, fermented, and distilled here, or something to do with converting a fermentable substrate with endogenous enzymes, something like that. So all you have to do practically is mash, ferment, and distill. Mm -hmm. And you could probably do that within about a week. Would you say, yeah. like, oh, yeah, I mean, four you could to within seven if you know the time is right. I mean, your fermentation is two days. You know, you, you know, within within three or four days, you can have that s that barley in and then back off the island in a in a tanker. So there's no there's no legislation to say that you have to grow barley here. Nope. You don't have to malt here. You don't have to mature here. And you don't have to bottle here. Nope. 
So interesting, isn't interesting. it? <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. So so uh, yeah, an Isla whiskey where you know you you have a, a ten year old whiskey and it's an Isla whiskey and it spent three, four, five days a week of its life being made here with barley from. I mean, it could be anywhere. Um, it, so it comes to oil, it's, it's mashed, um, it's uh, fermented, it's distilled, it's filled into a tanker and it's maturing in Glasgow for the next 10 years. It's bottled, you know, in the bottling hole right there with Glasgow tap water, whatever. It's, it's, that's a very, I mean, it's still, it'll still be a good whiskey, you know? Yeah. Th that's fine. But the issue is, I think that, is it an oil whiskey? It's a difficult one for me as a local. Mm. I'm, um, Again, I've grown up on Isla and I've worked in the industry for a while now and it, it was something I didn't question before. And then, you know, obviously a couple of colleagues were saying here, but, you know, we, we do it all on, on the island. Actually, I used to work for another distillery and <gasps> I always used to <laughs> know when somebody had gone on a Bricladi tour and then they'd come to me <laughs> and they'd do another tour and they'd be like, so do you mature all your whiskey here? I'm like, oh, well, parts of it. And then some of it on the mainland. And do you do all your bottling here? Oh, no, we, d we do that in the mainland. And it, it didn't... I I mean, to some people, it's not important, and it might it might not yeah. ever be important for some people. But it is quite interesting to know that you can earn that Isla name that's got all this rich heritage yeah. and um, of whiskey making in uh, in about a week. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I suppose you know, like bottling whiskey and things like that, the process here that would that would never have been done on Isla. You know, the whiskey would always yeah, have been shipped true. away if it was majority here. So there's there's certain aspects where we've maybe you know at Brooklady over the years our, our focus has been on. On Isla, I mean, from day one, you know, reopening a distillery, it's been on, on, you know. So Mark Rainier, Simon Coughlin, the guys, you know, who were involved in buying it, they moved from London to Isla. So it wasn't just something like a, a plaything where they would just, you know, have a distillery. They they moved here and they invested. But much like, uh, you know, like Jim, uh, Jim McEwen, of course, um, an Isla man through and through. You know, it, it was it's so important that we bottled whiskey here, uh, that we matured the whiskey here, because you know that was providing jobs for, for people here. Yeah. That was that was you know about getting Brooklady back on its feet, about doing good things for the community, and then you know we've we've kind of extended this kind of thing. So right from the beginning, by bottling, or in two thousand and three when we started bottling, it was you know it was building up you know the isle the provenance to what it is we do. And I suppose back at the turn of the millennium, it was more important back then mm. because there wasn't this whiskey boom yeah. that the island's yeah. seeing now. I mean, when you look at the unemployment on the island, it's scarcely there. Mm -hmm. um, people need permanent jobs. They don't. Uh, I think we're struggling a little bit where we've got the employment, but it's not necessarily permanent. It's mm. quite seasonal. It's quite based yeah. on hospitality and tourism. But back <coughs> in 2001, when you reopened the distillery, that was probably quite different. You know, the unemployment rate was slightly higher. There wasn't the boom in single malt that we had now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really, you know, I, I'm sure it has turned the fate of the Rins around, having oh, for sure. like Brookladdy and Cohoman for that yeah, matter absolutely, on, yeah. on the Rins. Yeah, I, I, it definitely has. I mean, I, I um, went to school in Port Charlotte, you know, so I, you know, I, was, when I was young. I would go past the distillery every day and it was just, it was always a place that was kind of, you know, you never went in. It was a factory, the gates were always shut, you know, if it, yeah. was, if it was closed or, or, or running. And um, you know, it was it was a very different place. And now you think of you know what we've got now, and the fact that we'll have so many people coming in to, to visit. It's an open place. There's so much going on here. Yeah. You know, it's the Isla Spring Water. It's the Isla Bottling. It's Isla Maturation. It's it's the whole thing. The Isla Barley. I mean, it, it's really in the last. I mean, it's been quite a while since I was at primary school, but in the last uh, last 25 years, um, you know. Um, Things have really changed. Maybe it's longer than that. We're not going to. We're not going to that. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, but I think it's it's really important, obviously, for what we do for the community that we don't just you know we don't just use the postcode to make whiskey. You know, we're we're doing everything yeah. here and providing you know employment and providing uh, good employment for people as well. But that's just our opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And we're obviously biased, of course, which is why we invited the critics. Yeah. So if if you do have any you know input or opinion on what actually makes an Isle of whiskey, does it have to be matured here? Does it not? Would it have a different impact on the island if all of the Isla distilleries matured here? What what is it that you know people are feeling at home? Yeah, there's a couple of there's a couple of things on that. Um, a couple of questions uh, that y only you can answer, Adam. Uh, so in terms of what we're doing in Isla at the moment, Jens Freemouth is one of the people who's asking, do you if you already know when do you think you are going to start with the malt floors? Hmm. Interesting. Not uh, malt floors. Uh, but that's well, the yeah, that yeah, has the yeah. question is asked. Well, that's. Uh, I, I struggle for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, a good question, uh, Jens. Um, hello, by the way. Uh, the malt floors. Um, at the moment, we 
you know, we, we've, it's a project we want to do. We don't have definite dates of when we'll start, when we'll finish, but over, you know, th within five years, I'd like to think we'd be malting um, Orila Bali here. So at the moment, we grow half of our kind of requirements on the island, and we then ship it 400 miles to MLS to be malted and bring it back. We want to, you know, from a kind of sustainability point of view, from a carbon footprint point of view, from, again, a 100% island point of view, we want to do that here, again, providing more employment. When we do this, uh, the, the plan, what we're looking at at the moment, isn't uh, the traditional malt flow, because to do that, to malt the amount we would need, we need a huge amount of space. So, you know, what do we do in the village? Do we just start buying it up and concreting it and, you know, building these kind of buildings? Mm -hmm. Or do we try and have a smaller footprint where we can be more efficient? Um, you know, we can... Oh, efficiency, that's not a word to hear bad Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's an interesting thing, though, when you have the opportunity to start from scratch. And, and again, this is the evolution of, of not just the, the distillery, but of, of the world at the moment where we don't want to be wasteful in what yeah, it is well we're doing. You're right, yeah, from a you sustainability know? point of view, so yeah, you're what I, what behind I, if you're not yeah. doing it. So when I use the term efficiency, we're still not going to be kind of squeezing every last drop out of everything, you know. People to that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that's what you'll be both, eh? Job market on uh, Monday morning. But, um, it's no, so the multi floor, uh, sorry, the multi, uh, the multi thing, what we'll do is can replicate what Baird's maltings do um, up in Inverness, which is a salad in box, which uh, actually from a, a traceability point of view on the small batches of barley, we'll, you know, if we're doing small batches, we're able to keep that separate everywhere. If, you know, so if, if Hunter Jackson grows 30 tonnes of barley at the moment, that just gets mixed in with kind of everyone else's barley. But by malting here, uh, we'll be able to, with the salad in box, we'll be able to um, really focus on you know the variety that Hunter grew, you know the um, the tonnage that he grew. Keep that separate, distill that separately. So, if we just did a malt flow, we wouldn't be able to do that. If by by being more efficient, if you like, we'll be able to really kind of focus on some of the things that we find really really interesting in the distillery and be able to do it better than we we currently do now. So, um, there's a lot of kind of romantic views of malt flows and how things should be done, but I think we have to look at it across every aspect of what it is we want to achieve. And it looks like a salad yeah, in box would be better. I've never heard of like a salad in box being a sort of a negative connotation. I mm. know that mm. um, r realistically, I think, what is there three distilleries that currently malt mm. on Isla? Mm. So it's not like it's completely widespread. It is the, the traditional way of doing things. But I've never heard of a salad in box being, you know, it's not a big industrial drum. Oh, it's, no, no. as you say, small, mm. small batches where yeah. we can trace stuff through. And, mm. and do you think we'll be able to do Port Charlotte here? The you know, the heavily yeah, heated yeah, stuff so that we've got in front of us? Absolutely, yeah. The, the idea is that we'd be able to produce Proclari, Port Charlotte uh, and Octomo here. So, um, mm. again, that leads us into the kind of terroir of peat, if you like, or the, you know, the different flavours you'll get from peat from different regions. So, um, you know, I think when you, when you look at what it is we're trying to do, it, the, the advantages across, you know, really kind of zeroing in on the, the detail of what it is we do, we'll be able to get a lot more focus, a lot more depth. Um, so I think it's a really positive thing. I think it's a really good thing. Yeah, the, the peat's an interesting one, because mm. particularly when we are, you know, raising the sort of questions around what makes an Isla single malt. Yeah. And at the moment we are malted in Inverness and we are using mm. peat from the Highlands yeah. or from around um, Beard's malt. So to us, we, we haven't used much of Isla peat before. I think we've experimented we've so, with yeah. it once before, yeah. but um, it's something that we've kind of sacrificed almost mm. because I think we'd have liked to have done it here just to get that traceability and to get that provenance and to make sure we were working with the right partner and beards. For sure. Yeah. So I, I think this is a, I think there's, a, there's an element of, you know, having to, you know, walk where you can run with what we, we we'd, if we could, we'd be doing, you know, so many different things, we'd look at so many different aspects, but there's so much yeah. to do. <laughs> um, and you think and like we've made so little progress. <laughs> well, I suppose you could look at it that way, but, you know, you look at the last kind of, what, seven years, we've doubled the amount of staff we have, we've, you know, increased production, we've done so much. There's so much work to do around the distillery, you know, we're building warehouses, we're, um, you know, the, the products we're making, you know, the, all the kind of stuff that's going on. There's, there's so much, but our aims and our ambitions are always, you know, pushing us forward, so yeah. we'll get there. Okay, yeah. we'll no, right. no, yeah. it, it's, it's <laughs> not at all. Obviously, I work in PR, so I'm here to cue you up <laughs> in, a, in a totally biased way. Yeah. But um, for me, it's always about yeah that traceability. And um, Lynn, who's a, who we work with on the malt side, is always saying like we're trying to retrofit a Victorian distillery. Hmm. So for us, if we had, you know, there's a lot of craft distillers coming online now. They can absolutely design everything perfectly to work, and I think we almost look with a bit of jealousy, like, oh, imagine if we, you know, had a blank canvas where we could draw it all. Yeah. But for us, we've been established in '81. We've tried really hard to kind of keep the old sure, museum yeah, yeah. working in a way. So, 
for us it's about yeah like a jigsaw piece of trying to fit everything together so that eventually we can get round to doing everything the way that we believe is right and like you say it doesn't all happen at once so. exactly it takes time and that's th that's what whiskey is all about you know it takes time it takes people it takes a lot of uh, a lot of bob and a lot of uh, a lot of things but we'll we'll get there it takes folk on twitter too <laughs> so um alistair at spirit and wood says uh Isla whiskey as a category is well understood by the consumer at large. Questioning the definition is commendable, but clearly disrupt disruptive. Might a better solution be to define a new subcategory that complements rather than conflicts? Is that what microprovenance is? Mm, that's a very interesting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, to kind of touch on a little bit of that, the, like we're not trying to be kind of disruptive and tell it, you know, say that we're right and everyone else is wrong. That's absolutely not what we've, we're, yeah. we're doing here. It's just that we have an opportunity and a, and a belief in how we want to make whiskey and it, it's raising the debate because um, not everybody knows or uh, not everybody knows how whiskey is, is made by each distillery on island, how that, that all fits in and what other people do, what people don't do, what people assume, what people don't assume and I think what we've been, it's like a transparency thing, everything we yeah. do is about being transparent and we, we really want to focus and, and like, we don't have to talk about any of this kind of stuff. But we ourselves find it interesting. Yeah. We ourselves care about it. So the fact that we talk about having 100 employees, or 101, or 105, or how many people uh, we have, because it seems to increase rapidly all the time. <laughs> um, but you know, every that time you've written something down, it's kind we've of added it exactly. There's yeah. another something changes. But um, but you know, th it's something that we believe is important to us, and we want to talk about it. So we're not trying to be disrespectful to anyone else. And if everybody did what we did, then Isla would be ruined. Yeah. You know? I mean, that, that's an important yeah, balance to the, the, the story. So. Um. Back, back to the question, I think it is an, a really interesting one because it almost goes to kind of marketing. It's like, okay, they understand the Isla category, but it, to people, Isla almost means heavily peated. Mm. It means, you know, it's, it's a flavour. It's not yeah. something that necessarily connects it to the island or to the community or to the place itself. Mm. And, and I think that that's m more of our, our point about it is, yeah. you know, uh, again, we're not trying to discredit anyone for for doing anything a certain way we just we want to bring it back to what we believe is an expression of the place that we live absolutely it, it, i mean yeah we live here we know what it's like but it's more than just a place where peated whiskey is made yeah you know and, and i think yeah that's that's really important that we don't you know but how does that fit brocladi or butterhaven you know because they're not you know we, we don't brocladi isn't peated whiskey but Haven isn't peated whiskey so if isla is yeah. just a peated whiskey region that that does nothing to um, to kind of talk about the, the um, you know how each distillery makes whiskey and the, the particular things that are important with them. So again, it's the detail I think and the transparency that I think we would really want to focus on. Again, it is, it is quite a, a geeky level, and don't get us wrong. If we're you know out in the world and like a lot of us travel with our jobs to go and present, and it's always Isla first. We always talk about Isla as a place, mm -hmm. as you know, a proud place where we come from that we you know, sing the praises of the people here. And, you know, Robert, you were saying the other day, it's it's every distillery on Isla, on Isla does something for the community. They do employ some people, yeah. you know, they do give back um, to the local community. So again, it's not, we're not trying to discredit anyone. We're no, just trying no. to say, we wonder if there is a different way mm -hmm. to have a definition, but it, it's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Maybe the subcategorization is yeah, a, a good one. It maybe would be, yeah. But I think it's just, for us, it's important, I think, just to, to talk about what it is we do. Um, yeah. So we believe it's important. Let's talk about it. Let's be transparent. Um, so w I think, so just to, to come back to <coughs> whiskey, we, we, we've nearly <laughs> finished the first dram and then got a bit distracted. <laughs> um, I was just going to say on this uh, on this uh, dram here that this 2011, um, bottled at six years old, this would have been one of the component parts for the, um, the 2011 Port Charlotte uh, uh, Isla Barley we released, which is now finished. Um, so you know, it would have played a part in that and it would have brought you know, that kind of fruitiness, that, that floral aspect. There's a lovely creaminess to it as well, which uh, was again on the palate one thing I picked up. But because we don't want to be here having breakfast with you, you know, so we're going to try and move on to the next, uh, the next whiskey, which is... Um, Cast number 3,403, which is a 2008 first fill bourbon cask. Should we mention that people at home should definitely not feel restrained to wait for us to finish yabbering to have their next round? <laughs> yeah, pe people have died of thirst while <laughs> I've been talking. Uh, so I would, yeah, don't, don't wait for us, you know, please just Sorry. dive in and enjoy the whiskeys uh, as Kirsty's doing right now. So, um, yeah, the, the it's important that... Um, 
you know you enjoy this and, and yeah, don't we just while we're talking about all the kind of things we're talking about then yeah please feel free to enjoy the whiskey um pour it let it open let it breathe a little bit i do have to admit I, um and this is just personal preference and again i hope you don't shoot me but i love the fact that we bottle everything at cast strength i think it gives it such body and viscosity yeah. and you know keeping all the natural oils in there makes a huge difference there is something almost um don't know if it's the youth don't know if it's the strength but or just the fact that I'm a bit of a weakling, but I always enjoy an Isle of Barley a bit better with a bit of water in it. Yeah. But I do enjoy the fact that I'm given that choice to do it myself and it's not completely watered Absolutely. down. Absolutely. Well, yeah, uh, you can <laughs> the great thing about as they do in these, these uh, microprovenance and indeed releasing whiskey at higher strength is that you get an opportunity to taste it in its kind of natural form, if you like. Um, for most of the whiskies, we will you know, bring down to 50% because the balance of flavour, you know, I feel, will be better by doing that and by blending. And you know, Tasting these three individual whiskies, as I mentioned before, they're not all complete, perfect whiskies, but you know, that's part of what blending is. It's understanding and getting to the bottom of each whisky and how they'll work together. But bottling it at cash strength and giving people the opportunity to taste it at cash strength, it's, it's quite a refreshing thing to do. And again, mm. yeah, you get the choice of adding water or not is entirely up to you. Um, and again, these whiskies, uh, you know, taste them first without, and then please do add water to them. Uh, that's, you know, we have some here, mm. and we'll do that and talk about that as well. But they are quite different. Yeah. So obviously, there's, a, there's an age difference there. Yep. Um, one is nine. One is uh, one is six. Um, so that's going to play a part. The barley variety is different. Um, they're both first fill bourbon, but both from different origins, um, which I really find plays a, a big difference, particularly with. Uh, with this one here, this, um, if I look through my notes. Do we happen to know the farms for these ones, Adam? Or are they? Yeah, well, the farms is interesting because we, we don't actually know the farms uh, for these specifically because of the, the process of making um, of malting. the port shallot of the yeah, malting, yeah, so there's yeah. going to be a, a mix and match. And again, what we've done with the, the single farms in the past is kind of reserved them for uh, Brooklady. Yeah, okay. So yep. uh, in the early days when maybe there's less farmers growing and less volume there, we were able to, you know, to be able to, you know, we will state the farmers and more, but a mixture, mixture of everyone. Um, but when we were a bit smaller, you'd maybe focus on, you know, like the 2007 Rockside or whatever yeah. it may be, or the 2004 Control as, a, as an Isle of Barley. And then everything else would be blended together. But the process of making or malting the Isle of Barley for Port Charlotte is that you heavily peat a batch and then you figure out, you analyze it for what its PPM is. Mm -hmm. And then when you work out if it's, you know, 125 or whatever it is in the, in the PPM, you then blend unpeated. Um, so it's not an exact science, well. it's more of a exactly, blending yeah, of yeah, malt. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, so that so that's, that's how it's done. Um, so once we have our own maltings, you, we will be able to be a bit more traceable where yeah, we would know absolutely. the farms. And of course, in our Port Charlotte Isle of Barley, we do know which farms they've yeah, come from, absolutely. the ones that actually make yeah, it to the shelf. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we do. And I think, I don't know if I actually wrote it down, but I did get a list of the, the farms that we, you know, obviously the guys that grew in um, uh, in 2007 that made this 2008 and the guys that grew in 2010 that made this 2011. So apart from, we'll segregate the single farm. So James Brown, Octomore, his barley will be kept for Octomore of Octomore, the 8.3, 7.3, 6.3. Um, the point three expression. Um, we'll be doing single farms from at the moment with uh, with Island Farms, so Ian McCarroll, mm. um, uh, Sunderland Farm with uh, Raymond Stewart. Uh, so everything else basically will go into the either the Isle of Barley or Port Charlotte uh, Barley. Um, so yeah, we have to again traceability on, on who grew uh, for us. But coming back to tasting this, whiskey. sorry, sorry. No, it's fine. It's fine. Um, so yeah, on the nose. Um, uh, I've skipped the drama here, sorry, I'll come back to number two. Um, so we're quite fruity on this one. Um, again, you've got that kind of nice kind of floral aspect. You get that kind of creaminess uh, coming through on the nose. It's cereal, there's, there's um, you get that maltiness and there's a kind of a caramel aspect to it. And then I picked up, uh, again, doing this earlier on, it was quite minty. You get a little menthol mm. kind of, yeah. kind of a, like a green uh, kind, of, uh, kind of edge. Um, but again, really gentle, really fresh. The peat isn't really leaping out the glass at you there. It's still quite gentle. It's there, but it's not, again, overpowering. I just have to shut myself up sometimes <laughs> to not ask any questions. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> 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 
Um, in, in fact, before I ask a question, can I, if I don't shout out to my son Callum, who's watching and commenting every two minutes, I'm going to get shot. So, <laughs> hi Callum, everyone go to his YouTube page. That is uh, an over uh, 18s only. Uh, I know exactly. He's, a, he's a <laughs> 17 and a half. <laughs> so, um, so uh, at Malt Mentalist, Stu McIntyre says here he's the best looking man on Ruth Laddie Whiskey Twitter. I don't know about that, but uh, he says... Maybe uh, after we've drank all of this. <laughs> <laughs> he says, uh, who supplies your bourbon casks and do you stick to one distillery or do you experiment with different bourbons? So we take our bourbon casks in from Speyside uh, Cooperage. Um, so, and we take a, a variety. So in the past we maybe did um, uh, buy from one specific uh, distillery, but again, with the demand of bourbon casks and, and the industry, basically, you know, we were a good customer for this uh, distillery, and then other people were offering more, so we weren't that important a customer anymore. So, um, no, no, no. Well, I mean, it's just it's the way it is, isn't it? You know, wrong side of Adam. You'll talk about it in live tastings. And absolutely, years yeah, absolutely. But, um, but so I mean, that was years ago. But actually, what we what we've done, and even when we were working with this distillery, we were obviously getting other supply of other uh, bourbon casks as well. But through Speyside, we'll be sourcing from you know basically across America. So uh, it could be you know literally every type of, type of cask, every type of bourbon producer will we'll get a variety of. Um, and that's really actually quite important because it gives us a variety. So not it's not like a bourbon cask is a bourbon cask is a bourbon cask. Depending on you know, the mash bill of that bourbon, depending on how long that cask has been aged, depending mm -hmm. on the char level that the bourbon uh, distiller requests in their barrels, you get quite a variety. And that's just interesting. That helps build the flavour profile of what it is we're trying to do. You know, if you, uh, I think probably looking back, focusing on just using one uh, distiller to supply the bourbon barrels probably wasn't best thing. And wasn't so geeky it enough for exactly, us. Exactly, it wasn't geeky <laughs> enough for us. So, so yeah. Uh, if you do ever look at the kind of maturation profile, particularly of the Octomores, mm. like uh, either the 8.1 or the 9.1, and I have to stop myself from talking about products we might be releasing <laughs> in the future, <laughs> um, but particularly the 0.1 additions, um, you can always see what mm. a percentage of bourbon cast we've used from each distillery, can't you? So mm. it's yep. I don't know if we're allowed to use the brand names of them anymore, but yeah, there's a there's a selection. Yeah, there is, and I think it, it, it does play a part. If you just stick with one type, you know, it maybe we'll work at different age profiles or different types of spirit. So give ourselves the variety. And again, when I come to to blend and pick those uh, those samples, when you look through them and taste them all, when you pick what you like, it's it's not just as simple as you know bourbon cask. It's Do interesting. Do you ever feel slightly baffled by just how technical we get sometimes? Like, is it, is it quite nice sometimes to think, like, there is an overarching philosophy and a bit more fluffy things to work with rather than just the... Because if it were me, I'd be, like, I'd be quite overwhelmed by it all. I, um, I don't know. Well, I, 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 to be honest, no, I don't think I don't really get overwhelmed by it. I think, it's, I think it's just really interesting. And I think that, again, having the opportunity to explore and experiment and to... Again, if we just used one type of bourbon, I didn't care. It was just all bourbon anyway. Yeah. Then it's just not that interesting it doesn't really suit me I think you know I've, I've been raised in making whiskey this way so yeah. it is about the detail it is about you know crafting something where you you can understand the process and you can see the ingredients it's not just you know bland you know it's it's, yeah. it's about really experiencing or experimenting with what it is you've got and making the best of that and it must be such a cool job to have to know that like your own learning is based on what you do yeah so you're kind I of like given a, so, yeah. a bit more <laughs> free rein to be like, oh yeah, yeah, I'd like to do this because this is interesting and why don't we do that? And yeah, well, I mean, it, I suppose, yeah, again, I'm, I'm lucky that that's the kind of way I've been taught how to make whiskey is that, yeah. that, is that there is that freedom, there is that uh, expression and that's how we learn and develop, you know? So I think if, if it was just down to blending and making everything taste the same, uh, which is, it, you know, I mean, as a, as a blender, it's an incredible skill to be able to you know, work with these different whiskies and work with different barley varieties and different casks because there will always be natural variation anyway. To be able to, to blend that into a, a, a product that is the same year upon year, you know, blend after blend, that's an incredible skill. But I would find that quite restrictive because really what you're able to do is, is um, you know, by tasting the spirit, nosing the spirit, you know, filling it into different types of casks, watching it develop, watching it mature, you're able to really allow that whiskey to be what it what it is, you know, and, yeah. and by not seeking to kind of fight against it and make it the same all the time, you end up with some really amazing whiskies. The 2010 Bear Barley, if I may put a shameless plug in for that, is an unbelievable whiskey. Uh, you know, all the Bear Barleys are good, but there's something about that vintage that just raises it above and makes you really take mm. notice. And the, the flavor profile is incredible. 
I'd love to be able to highlight that. You know, I think that's that's a really interesting thing. It's quite nice to know that you're not the only person that thinks that as well. Yeah. I mean, we've just sent them all out to review to journalists, and it, it has yeah. been re it's a reviewed very study, well. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's nice to know that you're humble enough to say half of it's like nature and half of it's me in the warehouse. Yeah, it's good. We'll see. Fifty <laughs> half fifty. Half. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Talking of uh, the freedom that you have to experiment, Adam, there's a few people, different people of, people keep mentioning Rye, don't know where they've got that from, it's just a rumour, as, far, the best as, far, as, secret as far as I know. <laughs> um, so there's a few questions about how Rye whisky or, uh, could possibly fit into our future in terms of terroir and, and traceability, and also a couple of questions on in fact, a lot of questions on if we ever plan to make a Port Charlotte using beer barley. Mm. Well, just to touch on the beer barley with Port Charlotte, at the moment, no, because there is such a small amount of it grown that we would keep that. I mean, we, I mean, we used, I think this year, or we'll use this year about 2,600 tons of barley or thereabouts. 40 tons of that is beer barley. So it's, it's tiny, it's tiny. absolutely What's that tiny. In a week's production? Um, weeks? If we no, if we if we usually we'll do a seven ton mash, uh, ten a week. What we would do with the bear barley is uh, five ton mashes. Yeah, okay. Eight five ton mashes a week. Uh, so it will last us one week if we stretch it out. So it's, it's absolutely <laughs> okay. tiny. Okay. So, um, so uh, yeah, the po the bear barley I think um, from the point of view of really focusing on that variety and its flavour. By peating it, we add another complication to it. So, kind of touching on some of the points you made before, mm -hmm. if we if we keep it as Brocladi, where we don't have the influence of peat, we can focus a little bit more on the variety of barley. Um, what was the rest of the question? Sorry, no. rye. Uh, rye. Where, where might rye uh, fit in with what we do in terms of uh, provenance, traceability, terroir? Mm -hmm. What what um, what work have we done with that in that respect? And that's from Ayladi. So the rye is uh, is a really interesting part of the you know the program that we have here, the distillation program. It really wasn't born from a wish to be cool and make rye whiskey and do something no one else had ever done. It was done because when we're looking at the you know the Isla Bali project, which you know over the last few years has become more and more successful, and we're looking at uh, farming practices and agriculture and our responsibility as a, as a purchaser of, of malted barley to be responsible about that. We start looking at crop rotation, about land management, and you know the, the farmers in Isla are quite restricted to you know, the crops they're able to grow, because uh, if you're rotating, if you're growing barley one year and grass and livestock on the, far on the field the next uh, year, you know, you'd want to try and maybe have five or six different rotations in that field to really have the best kind of soil. Yeah. Um, but you know, for a farmer in Isla to grow carrots, and then have that as a crop to export. By the time he exports that to the mainland, it's already too expensive to sell. It's priced itself out in the market. So the options are limited. So as part of that um, kind of thing, we were looking at other cereals that we could distill, we, we would be then able to, uh, to you know, add into the rotation. And rye is a really interesting crop because it will, it will be a good part of the cycle that will put back into the soil for, um, for growing barley. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, people make rye whiskey. We thought, well, if they can do it, we can do it. Um, it, it seemed to be quite an interesting thing that. Um, yes, I'm sure all the mashmen thought that at the time. Yeah. Were the they not all cursing you? So <laughs> yeah, the, 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 well, I mean, because we you are know, working with rye, we know it's going to be it's completely different to barley. Um, the way it behaves, you know, it's 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 uh, the, the way the grain is formed, everything's completely different, and we didn't malt it. So uh, one of the guys, one of the farmers we work with, Andrew Jones, um, who's up at Cool Farm on the west coast. Uh, Andrew grew some rye for us as an experiment, I and mean he's you know young guy. He's really interested um, in in kind of diversification and trying new things and coming along the journey with us. So he grew rye for us in 2017. We uh, kept some Isla barley uh, back, so we would blend Isla barley, malted Isla barley with the rye. The rye was not malted, mm -hmm. so we had to think about how we would uh, mash that, how we we process that. So when I you know looking at the research we'd done, we th we had an idea, we tried it. And you know we would usually do a seven-ton mash of uh, malted barley, which would take us about nine hours. If we thought well, we would do a, a smaller mash, about four and a half tons, with a mixture of 55% rye, 45% barley, uh, malted barley. Um, the very first one we did, uh, Gordon, who's the uh, kind of the story manager, and myself, we were kind of doing 12-hour shifts shadowing the mashman just to make sure everything was going okay. We were learning and seeing what was happening. Yeah. So. Uh, 10 o'clock on Sunday night, we all put the mash in, 
Robert was there. You were the you and the Gordon stayed worst, on that. Worst uh, week of my life. That's why he's been moved to cons. Yeah. So <laughs> bad at terrible, mashing rye. Terrible mashing rye. Yeah. No, after mashing rye, I went. That is it. I am done. <laughs> it was quite a traumatic <laughs> experience because <laughs> when when I, at ten o'clock, you know, mash went in. I went home. Right, boys, see you later. Came back in at six o'clock in the morning, and uh, they were still on the first water. Oh. Which so I think that first mash was about fifteen hours. I think so. I think it was almost a double shift yeah. for the for like between the two shifts. Yeah. Where normally a mash would be anywhere between yeah. eight. But Graham Kirk and I got it no bother. So <laughs> 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 yeah, but it was because it's gloopy. Or yeah, or it was it was really gloopy. Uh, again, there's no kind of no husk to it, so it, it doesn't drain the same way. Yeah. Um, again, the temperature again because of the you know we hadn't malted it um, and it's so gloopy that it just didn't drain. Uh, it was just awful to work with. So it was a really interesting thing to do with that small amount. We did do these mashes and figure out a way of making that kind of Victorian equipment work to, to do that. And by the end of the week, we pretty much got it. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we pretty much got it. If interested in seeing a little bit of the how-to, Jane, who's in our comms department, department and is based here all year round, kind of doing the iPhone videos, she shot you guys, not... Shot, no, we felt like She it shot, <laughs> <laughs> shot you guys um, <laughs> actually mashing it. So yeah. if you want to be a bit geeky afterwards, you can go and have a look on our YouTube channel about how the first yeah. rye mash went. Yeah, it, was, it was a really interesting learning experience. It was amazing to be able to take spirit from it and be able to, you know, to, to run that spirit and get something. So we filled, filled some casts in 2017. Uh, we're watching it develop. And I think uh, you know, how it fits into our story is you know, it's, it's about the barley. It's about the, the sustainability of, of growing. It's, a, it's about know trying to do something new to do something yeah. different to uh, you know yeah to bring the marketplace home yeah absolutely. for the farmers so yeah could end up with potato vodka and well let's any crop that they can grow we'll distill it that's what we said let's see it? how we go on shall we let's oh. step one step at a time but uh, but no, i'm pleased to say the the rye um the rye is an amazing spirit really interesting obviously to, to watch it develop and Andrew's grown again for us this year, so we'll be able to distill something before Christmas um, and watch it develop again. It was, so. it was looking good around Coolway, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. And Andrew's uh, probably the first Isla farmer to put sunflowers in his field, which has yeah. been really nice this year to see a bit of um, spring barley right next to some yeah. corridors of sunflowers. Yeah. Which, which is great beautiful. For, the, for the wildlife, it's great for even like kind of managing his soil so that there's you know, a strip around the outside that's... Uh, I mean, Again, it's just trying to be to to kind of develop and improve all the time. So Andrew's uh, understanding some great stuff there. It's brilliant. It's it's nice to see that people want to you know learn and progress just mm -hmm. just like we do. Kind of yeah, like absolutely. Like minded. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I think that with all the other farmers we work with, that everyone is you know really keen to develop. Everyone's really keen to be involved. And um, again, no matter you know their approach to, to making barley, it's still a very very cool thing to be able to see. You know, if you're growing barley, yeah, to be able to see you know the where that has gone, the product, it's, it's absolutely incredible, so. Yeah, um, take our hats off to them. It's absolutely. Not an easy job. Well, no, we, we had, um, when the harvest started a couple of weeks ago, lovely weather for a few days, and then the heavens opened, and it was awful, and again, you just, you think to these guys, like, the risk they take in growing for us every year, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. So hats off to them indeed. Um, anyway, sorry to bring it back to whiskey again, but we got halfway through tasting uh, the <laughs> second <laughs> dram, so if we just have a little, um, a little taste of that. On the palate, mm. really malty. You need to get that cereal, mm. that kind of porridge, and there's a that same. Before you get the peat, you get that same kind of fruit or like stone fruit and peach. Really, really start to come across the palate. Um, it's quite syrupy. It's like oaty. It's you've got that kind of flapjack kind of thing. It's a really, really interesting flavour. And then when the peat comes through as well. You've got that lovely balance, kind of like we talked about before, the balance between the flavour from the malt and the uh, flavour from the smoke. And the mm. bourbon just gives it that lovely caramel, vanilla, kind of creaminess in the background. It sits really, really nicely, so. Um. There's a lot of uh, taste notes coming in from Twitter. Uh, a lot of uh, burnt bitter toffee, creamy porridge oats, as you say, Adam, strawberries and cream, peach. It's uh, very highly rated. I don't think I've seen a negative uh, yet, which is always nice. But if you do have any, if you Even want to tell us it's rubbish, cynics. tell us it is. Pardon? Even from the cynics? No, no, no. they no, just hate no. our marketing, but not our liquor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, it's all us that are yeah. they hate and that's add fair. Right. I mean, that's traditional, is it not? <laughs> to yeah. hate the comms department. Yeah, exactly. We'll, take <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll keep making good whiskey, eh? that's yeah. uh, no matter what. Your job is so can. easy, Adam. <laughs> Yeah, I'm good, kidding. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, a so yeah. Of, there's a couple of questions, Adam, just about 
specifically the whiskey mm -hmm. that you're talking about. Um, wh what goes out when you're when you're picking out a micro provenance tasting? Wh and obviously you're looking at things that are slightly different than if you're picking out one for a core range. So mm -hmm. what goes into uh, picking the micro provenance bottles that, that you wouldn't do with something else? So yeah, well, th it's interesting because. Um, for this, because you know, we picked it, or I picked it so long ago, like almost two years ago, um, I have no idea, I can't remember. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no, no, I think obviously <laughs> with the, the micro provenance, it was, you know, f first and foremost, it was about, okay, let's, we're going to focus on Port Charlotte Liquid, on Isla Bali, so, you know, uh, that was really the kind of focus, so that obviously narrows down what we want to talk about. And then selecting them, I was, uh, with the 2011, because we were developing the Port Charlotte 2011, just having that single cask, that really expresses the, the kind of the subtlety, the gentleness of, of how the Port Charlotte fits in with the, that bourbon cask. Um, that was really why I selected the first one. With the next two being 2008, um, it was kind of more to focus on the, um, the, the kind of cask and the, the vintage there as well. So again, what we're trying to do with the, these three small bottles is focus on literally everything. You know, so where they are in the warehouse, um, the cask we just tasted here was matured in warehouse 13, which is a, a racked warehouse. It was at the very bottom. So the influence of where that is, it's quite a, a cold, um, you know, there's no extremes of temperature. It's, it's quite a steady maturation. <laughs> Whereas the next one we'll taste is in a Dunnage warehouse, a warehouse six, um, which I think comes through in the flavor. You get that earthiness, you know, so it's really about shaping the flavor of the whiskey and looking at every single thing. With these, to be honest, there isn't a lot of liquid. In the 2008, there's not a lot of whiskey to choose from, uh, which again is quite quite interesting. You know, that stuff has been left behind because it maybe will have a be able to mature further. You know, be able to mature better, but um, not if we drink it, obviously. Is it true? Heard a bird say once that um, when the Isle of Barley, there's some that kind of comes in from each harvest, where some of it goes to Bucladi and some of it goes to Port Charlotte. And in Port for Port Charlotte, I guess in 2008, because that's the year of distillation, mm -hmm. it all went to Port Charlotte, and then there was no 2009. <laughs> was there a slight blunder yeah, along yeah. the way? Well, no, <laughs> at some point? no, not at all. I, I think we you know going back to. I mean, we, we forget. We obviously we're thinking that where we are in the present now, everything's dead, dead easy. We've got a system. We've developed over the years where we've been, um, you know, the that guys who are driving tractors, literally, like as we're talking, they're driving tractors up and down. They take it down to Octafad. Andrew Wood there will then dry it, store it, and then as we take malt in, the malt lorry will deliver for us, then go down to Octafad, pick it up, take it up to Inverness. It's a, you know, it's a fine, um, a fine kind of oiled machine at the moment, the way it, it works. But you go back 10 years, and we're still developing it, and maybe Andrew didn't have the capacity, and we had to send things up to maltings, and then how that fits into our production schedule of how much Port Charlotte we want to make. When we make it, it maybe wasn't as streamlined <laughs> at that time Be and you know and it's, it's streamlined another word you'll get sacked for <laughs> <laughs> well again i think um it's, it's important to think about like our production program you know to counter your streamlined uh, thing we make about oh, this year we'll distill about 15 different spirit types yeah. uh, we have to think about the you know we have to get that shed emptied andrew where andrew would stores all that barley for us we've got to get it emptied by the time these guys start cutting barley so we have to have a really kind of fine-tuned production plan of when we distill, how we distill. So, so I've taken this far too personally, aren't I? <laughs> but uh, but it is, there's well a it's quite interesting because that's the stuff that you would never yeah. normally think about, just yeah. how much logistic That's the thing, the, the planning. So, so we'll start planning now as the harvest coming in for roughly what we'll get next year and how that fits into the production plan. Also thinking about the guys up in Pitgaveny who've got the organic farm, about uh, the guys who've got um, the bear growing up in Orkney, how that all fits into the malting schedule and what they've got to do. So it's, it's really complicated. So yeah, go back 10 years and one thing starts to come out of line and then yeah, we end up having to peat all that Isle of Bali. And then the next year, well, we've got lots of 2008, we don't need any 2009. So um, yeah, mm. again, I've gone down another rabbit hole, haven't I? So Just <coughs> while you're um, to go completely off topic, while we're toasting absent friends of um, we started with Carl. Um, you mentioned there Pitt Gavney and the regional trials. Mm -hmm. um, it was maybe in April or March, uh, May this year. Um, I did a bit of a road trip with our photographer Anton mm -hmm. to go and meet our regional barley trial farmers. Is that right? I don't even know if I'm speaking correctly <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I've been comparing and contrasting too much. But um, we went up and spent some time with each of the regional barley 
farmers. Mm -hmm. um, so Tom in the Lothians and then Colin in Aberdeenshire and Donald Jack up in um, Kilcoy in the Black Isle. And very sadly, Donald, after we'd just visited, passed away. So mm -hmm. I'd like to raise a small toast to Absolutely. Donald, if that's all right. Well Cheers. Cheers. Good honour. Oh, that 10 year old's so soft when it sits for such, mm -hmm. <laughs> such a long time. Not that it's not soft before. Again, don't no, get defensive. No, I, think so. I think it's a great thing to think about again about how these whiskies taste when you give them a bit of time to open. Um, um, I'm really surprised between these two. So the six year old, I think, tastes a lot softer than the nine year old, mm. which is not something that um, I would expect. Maybe I've just added a wee drop more water and mm -hmm. I don't know if people are saying that at home, but. You know, you th you think age is the only yeah. factor, but there must be something in there. Oh absolutely. Well, again, th I think a lot of it will come back to the the, the cask. I think a lot of it will come uh, where it's uh, where it's stored, mm. and the relation to the spirit that it has in that cask. And the great thing, uh, this is just a perfect example of you would assume that the older one is going to be smoother and better. Yeah. I say better. You know, it's going to be smoother or, or whatever, but. You know, there's there's no kind of rules to this until you pull the bung and taste the whiskey that's inside. You don't know what's yeah. exactly happening. So it's just a, a really a great example again of being able to share what we'll find in the warehouses here with everybody sitting at home. You know, so yeah. um, we, we actually had a really good uh, tweet about the comparison between the six-year-old and the nine-year-old, and I've lost it. <laughs> um, so apologies to whoever whoever you were because it was like really really good, and uh, I lost it. Uh, we'll but it tomorrow. Yeah, but uh, yeah. just very quickly before we move on, uh, a question uh, which I think I've probably all also lost uh, from Duncan McLean at Duncan J McLean. He says, uh, Adam, slightly contentious issue at the moment, maybe after recent YouTube videos, but uh, he says, uh, Adam, at what point are you working out the PPM value? Uh, I realise this also applies to the heavily peated Octomore. So the, the PPM value comes in the malt. Um, PPM is a really kind of interesting topic to discuss because PPM, traditionally, until I think until we started releasing Octomo, nobody really talked about the PPM. You know, it's, just, it's just heavily peated. Um, but more and more, I think it's become more commonplace. And so for us, you know, or traditionally in the industry, you would measure the PPM in the malt so that you get consistency in the malt you distill. So a particular distillery wants you know, 35 ppm in their malt, then they will request that the malt still provides it at 35 ppm. Um, so we're the same. When we talk about the ppm, it's in the malt because as soon as you um, distill that barley, you you know how you distill will give you different you know different times of year. You'll get different kind of levels of, of peat uh, coming through as you age it. You know whether it's 10 or 15 or 20 or whatever, you'll get different levels of peat as the phenols react. So it's very, very difficult to trace the exact phenols that you print on the bottle. So again, it's kind of a logistical type thing. If, you, you know, if you're producing a, a whiskey, you know, that's a 10 year old all the time, but the PPM changes, you know, you, you don't talk about the PPM and the spirit, you talk about the malt, because that's where it was all, all the same and how that, that spirit's been created from, so. Um, is, is it correct that when you're measuring the phenol levels, mm -hmm. that so you're, you're taking account of the phenol compounds yeah. But the phenol compounds, there are many different mm. types of phenols yeah. that give you many different types yeah. of flavour. So even though we say Port Charlotte malt is 40 ppm, mm. can there be different compositions of different yeah, phenol absolutely. types within yeah. each yeah. 40 ppm? Yeah. So yeah, you, you'll see that. And again, I think that's why most people will want in their spirit a consistency or the, in their production methods and the, uh, the barley and the malt a consistency so that kind of flavour profile stays. We're not particularly interested in that kind of thing. So when we start using Isla peat as opposed to peat from the Highlands, uh, for bears, again, that will give us an interesting um, kind of dimension on where the specific uh, phenols come through. Um, there's different ways of measuring that as well. So you could use uh, colorimetric, um, or you could use HPLC. Mm -hmm. HPLC will give you a, it will basically gather every phenol, whereas yeah, I think yeah. colorimetric is a bit more narrow and it's kind of banned. So, yeah. um, so again, we'll. we'll um, uh, interestingly, birds will use um, colorimetric for their analysis. Yep. We'll get the malt, and then we will also analyze uh, it by uh, HPLC H as well. So we'll, we've got we know again what we're, what it is for the effing. High performance liquid chromatography. If you're Absolutely. not familiar at home, it's 
exciting. Very exciting. It's, it, well, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But <laughs> it's something, again, that it's just another aspect of making whiskey with that, uh, particularly with Octomore. If you talk about Octomore, because we, we don't have a set phenol content for Octomore, essentially what's kind of been developed is that the very first distillation for Octomore was 80 ppm. Yeah. Um, and so that was the became the benchmark or the minimum. Uh, so Octomore as a brand is something that has a, a ppm that will range from 80 up to 309.1 um, ppm. Yeah, it was the 80, not 80.1 80 as well. Uh, it was 80.2, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, so sacked again. Oh, it's another, <laughs> another strike, <laughs> that's it. Um, so yeah, so th th it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, kind of thing, but uh, again, for us, I think it's about exploration, it's about particularly the Octomore, that initially it was very much about pushing the boundaries and kind of developing new techniques with the, the malts, it was about pushing and, and really raising that phenol uh, level. It yeah. wasn't about consistency and keeping the things the same, so. Yeah. Yeah. So we just take what beards can give us, basically. Yeah, as long as it's over 18. Yeah, which, yeah. Is, which is a fascinating thing, again, to see how that pe fits in with the, with the spirit. You know, and uh, year upon year, each release of Octomore we do, you've got a variation. So, um, you know, it's the, the interesting that the 309.1 has been the highest to have managed to do um, in the Isle of Bali. And the Isle of Bali this year was 307. Oh, so really? it was last year, sorry, it was 307, so we got close. Interesting. But it was, it's, uh, again, the balance in it is quite interesting. And so that'll take about five years to come out? Yeah, something think? like that, yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Set the countdown clock now, Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 yeah, I've, I've poured the, uh, the third dram, just, you know, trying to be efficient in, uh, in well our time. Well uh, very streamlined. Uh, so the third dram mm -hmm. of the MP series is, again, a 2008, um, second fill reef salt, so again you look at it, you see that, that kind of richer colour. French oak as opposed to American oak for the first two. Um, second fill again, so the, the reef salt is, uh, is kind of region in, in uh, the south of France where they produce uh, uh, fortified wine. Um, so it's quite sweet, it's, uh, it's almost like a, a sherry style depending on the variety we, we use. Um, but second fill you're going to get more oak and less influence from the spit of the wine that was in there before. And that's, that's, yeah. that's an interesting aspect for us to blend with because you're not getting too strong or too dominant a flavour. You know, it's the oak that's really working nicely. And French oak, depending on the toast, is really, really expressive. It can give us really different flavour profiles from the American oak, which is maybe more traditional. So a really interesting ingredient to, uh, to work with in the maturation. So, yeah, noting that again, you, you get that kind of pressure cloth at 62.6% alcohol. So again, high, high strength. I mean, one thing we've not really kind of looked at too much is the way that it sits in the glass, but particularly with this one, it mm. really, really coats the glass. You again, because it's like that high strength, you know, you're getting yep. it at its natural form, you really see the viscosity of it. Now, yeah, on the nose, completely different to anything we've had before. One big thing for me is that this is like a, like a ginger cake. You know, it's got that lovely oh yeah. kind of sweetness. It's got that spicy kind of ginger. So yeah. again, it's quite, the, the cask probably was quite heavily toasted to, uh, to kind of bring out that spiciness. You get this lovely marine kind of ozone note as well, which is, is really nice and like a, again like a cherry pie. You get this kind of lovely sweet, kind of rich, kind of dark fruit. I definitely get the ginger. Mm. At, f at first I'm always like, well, if it's a wine cast, it's going to be quite tannic. Cause yeah. You know, you get a lot of influence from the European oak in mm. there, but I, always, I don't know if that's whether I just think about European oak and then yeah. I smell what my brain thinks it knows <laughs> or not. <laughs> There's, there's maybe a bit of that, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I think mean that spiciness is really, really a lovely feature of that. Because again, it's the oak that's giving more. It's not the, the, the mm. reef salt wine that was in the cask that's giving uh, too much influence. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, on the palate, it feels a bit drier. Yeah. But then, there's this lovely thing where you get that kind of heat and then bang, that fruit comes through. Yeah. It really, really comes through across the so palate. so many layers in it. Really, really interesting that. Then you get the smoke. I mean, it's ju there's just something really, really nice about that. Very, very different. Um, I think it's a really nice um, whiskey for, for blending with. There's, there's, a, there's a, almost a bitterness to it now. Coming towards the end, you know, there's, uh, I don't know if it's the smoke or what, but you get this, um, it's not quite tannic, but you get almost a kind of a bitterness to it, um, which I think is quite nice. And the peat on the finish is like a, like a quite a dusty peat. It's not, mm. um, it's quite dry. It's for those of you who've ever been, you know, getting peat in off the moss when you get that, uh, yeah, uh, the peat cuff, I'm sure, <laughs> yeah, you've all do this yeah, every summer like, uh, like we do. Um, but when, when we were kids, that was how we spent our, our summer, was gathering peats in the moss. You know, it was great fun. 
Um, I didn't. No, I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah. um, but you get that kind of dusty, uh, dusty peat, you know, that kind of just dry earth, and that's, that's a note that comes through there. The two over here are giggling, <laughs> like so school children sorry, in the back. I can only too much, <laughs> too much whiskey. Because, because you said earlier that ca it was an adult show, Callum, my son, who's 10, has changed his avatar <laughs> and photoshopped on a beard and big bushy <laughs> eyebrows. <laughs> so, welcome back, Callum. Nice one, Callum. He's definitely old enough to enjoy this. A hundred times funnier than your father. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, Reef Salt, very fun. Reef Salt, yeah. Um, so, yeah, interesting cask. And, and just to kind of come back to one of the things you kind of talked about before, Rab, was um, like why we selected these two. Uh, it was part of what th this was, you know, these are individual casts, but when, we're, when I'm blending, um, it's about how they work together. So, if everyone has a little bit of these left together, if you take the second Rab, which in this class here, which is the, uh, the kind of eight year old bourbon cask, and you add probably that much, uh, just a little bit of that reef salt <laughs> into it, they work beautifully together. So individually, they may be, they don't work as you know perfect, these are amazing single casks, we can appreciate their, what they are together, but by adding a little bit of that reef salt in, you get a lovely combination. So you get a little bit of that spiciness coming through, you've got a lot more fruit coming from the, um, the, the bourbon. That's interesting. A little splash of water in there as well. I just have a bit of water already. But I think they do, all, they do all stand alone. They're For all sure. individually sure. interesting. I'm assuming that's, again, why you've chosen them. For sure, absolutely. But uh, uh, this was one of, the, one of the reasons these two were together, is that actually in the 2008 um, Isle of Bali, these are both components of that. Yeah. Uh, so it was really interesting, again, just when I was selecting these to think if we did a bit of kind of blending and look at how the casts work together. These two, I think, really, really work together. You get that lovely spiciness, you've got that, you get that lovely peach, you know, that lovely kind of nectarine, that ripe peach note. Very interesting. Is that a first for the Michael Province case? Blending. At the blending on the spot. Well, I it's interesting because um, if anybody at home thinks it didn't work, then you didn't blend it right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, just a little thing I thought would be interesting to do because we've, we're focusing on these casks and blending is such an important part. You know, the, a single cask that is got the balance and is good enough to be a single cask is quite a rare thing. Hmm. You know, each, each cask is expressing different, um, different aspects of, of its character. Some um, really suit being, you know, components to a blend. And I think these two really do, but when you blend them together, you get something that is kind of better than they are individually. And that's what better blending than is. Better some of its parts. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so even when we talk about these kind of single vintage, single um, uh, kind of farm releases, there's still an element of blending, of, of working those flavours to create something that shows everything off in its best light, which hmm. I think is, um, I just want to make sure that, you know, I don't get replaced. <laughs> <laughs> You just, well you I just don't know you if you can replace Jen McCune. I'm well. sure you can replace that. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, thank you, we Christy. Like thank you. Um, <laughs> no, I think it's just it's an important thing that it's not just about you know just taking one field, you know, distilling it one way and putting it to cask and then bottling it and that's it. There's, there's still a lot to it. So. So what you're saying is, really, when you think about it, that it's not just about the terroir on its own and standing alone. There is still a bit of human Absolutely. interaction, a bit of a human element that yeah. you have to come in and craft it a bit yourself. Absolutely, Wh whiskey doesn't happen without the interaction of people. If you just if you just left barley there, nothing nothing would happen to it. So there is a, that interaction with what we do. Yeah. I think it's really interesting when you think about what we do at Brooklady in this Victorian distillery where we're making whiskey by hand. Yeah, it's the skill, it's the intuition, it's the involvement. I mean, Robert will talk about this. If you can remember his days mashing, uh, you're slightly confused there. But <laughs> just, just when you when you think about it. different uh, <laughs> <laughs> when you think about the different, you know, like the uh, Colin took barley from Aberdeen every year. You get that Aberdeen barley and a mash done. It's different every year. You have to react differently, think differently about how you use it, how you mill it. And I think there's this amazing human interaction in what it is we're doing that is uh, is a big part all the way through the story. You know, whiskey just doesn't happen by itself. Funny with the regional trials mashing because the when you'd bring in the Aberdeen, Lothian, and uh, Black Isle separately, um, 
although they were completely different from each other, while, while we had it in the mash tun, it behaved differently. Mm -hmm. The wort tasted differently, it had different, different aspects. You could, when you took notes in your book, to look back the following year, um, they were consistent. So you could, by the end of the, the fourth year probably of, of me doing the regional trials, I could probably tell you what barley we were mashing by how it was behaving mm -hmm. in the mash tun, because although they were, they were all different from each other, they seem to just behave that same way every year in the mash tun. Slight differences, but the fundamentals would be the same. So, so we always would look forward, well, I would always look forward to the, to the Aberdeen more than other ones because it was the easiest to do. <laughs> so uh, so as, was my, as was my style. But it, just, it was just the way they behaved. It always had good drainage. It always came off well. It was, it, you generally, um, you generally get good results from it, and it was uh, yeah. I mean, it was it was funny the way it worked out, but yeah, it was always interesting. It is funny when you talk about terroir, and it, it is this like almost other wor worldly thing for for us. If you're not used to being in France and you're not used to working with grapes and you're not in that world, it can seem a bit scary. And then for me, it was really simple when again went to visit Colin in Aberdeen. And you just see how different Scotland is from the east to the west coast. Mm. And you kind of underestimate it a bit because yeah. you just think, oh, well, it's one country. So, you know, it can't. I mean, we're not Canada. It's not going to be vastly different from the east to the west. But even the size of Colin's fields were huge. You could run a combine through it. No bother. I mean, you can see why people grow on the east coast and why people here haven't until we had kind of had to give them the, you know, we'd really like you to do this. Yeah. But... When you see, you know, James Brown trying to harvest at Octomore and Neil's basically navigating the combine around <laughs> rocks and, you know, Scott's had to engineer the combine with extra wheels to make it float, basically. I think I've understood yeah, that correctly. Yeah, the ground sets off. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so Andrew had um, combine recently and it was just massive big chunks out of the field. Yeah. So it's totally different even from you know if you're just talking about the challenges that people face there's yeah. a complete difference is that Absolutely. not part of the kind of tapestry of, of it, it all is, yeah. and i suppose that's something that nobody ever thinks about or nobody ever focuses on but again because we have an involvement right the way through then you know and you've been up and visited the farmers and been yeah. on the farms and seen what they look like so of course that becomes part of the story because we we, we recognize that um, but I think, like again, it's, it's evolving all the time, and I think the, the when we talk about the regional trials, that's kind of what internally we've always called it. But I don't think it really does justice to what we're doing because we're not just taking like barley from a region; yeah. it's from a specific farm. You know, it's 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 you know from a really really kind of tiny location that really influences that barley. It's not just a generic kind of thing; it's a really specific single farm expression that we're distilling. Yeah. Um, and again, we can see the differences in the farms and the differences in the people and how they farm. And um, we taste the difference in the spirit and it all lines up and it all makes sense. You know? Does it? It really does. <laughs> does to me, <laughs> anyway. To me. <laughs> no, I mean, it makes sense to me that we would explore it, but I don't yeah. know. Do, uh, does it always line up and make sense? Yeah. And you're, well, I suppose if Robert's saying, you know, it mashes the same way, kind of mm -hmm. predictably, uh, eventually you get to a point where you do you start to have an understanding for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing to do, but only by doing that experiment and putting the time in and, and you know, following the, you know, everything down to the farmers and working with them and the maltsters and what we do here, I think um, it's only then when you go down to that level of detail and you taste the spirit and you build up over years and years and you taste the difference between Aberdeen, um, you know, Lothian's or, you know, Colin, uh, Tom and Donald's farms, their barley, when you taste the difference there, but then you taste Colin Turks, the different uh, vintages from 2014 through 2019. Yeah. Like only by doing that and by spending the time on it would you build up the knowledge. So Interesting. Can't wait to taste it. Yeah. Mm. Soon. soon, very soon. Soon, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, soon. Um, so, um, how are we for time? Are we, is everyone falling asleep at home? Are we still uh, getting questions? There's, there's, no yeah, there's still, there are, there's plenty of questions coming in. Uh, do, we have, do we have some more questions? G Jane's just, yeah, maybe we should have a yeah. few to finish up on, I suppose. Um, so Kevin, Kevin Grant, he's very complimentary of the third dram tonight, uh, and he's asking when we're going to release it and how much it's going to cost. I tried to tell him that it's not going to happen, but he's not giving up. Adam, thoughts? Um, well, we've bottled that cask now we're drinking it, so we can't really do that one again. Uh, um, uh, at Narciss, I hope I've got that right. I hope I've not made an arse of it. Uh, asks, is there a standard length of time that you would use in a first fill 
of any cash before it is used for a second fill, or do they all have their own lifespan? To be honest, yeah, they all have their own lifespans. It's all quite um, how long is a piece of string because, y yeah, <laughs> there's, there's no one rule fits everything here. So there could be some that would have been 10 or 15 years that have been first fill. There'll be some that will be a few months. Um, I think for what we kind of tend to do with like using a second fill cask here or even a third fill cask is when you empty that cask and you see the impact that it's had on the spirit, you then make a judgment on that cask as to what you do with it next. So um, mm. you just have to take it case by case. You know. So are, y are you doing that all individually or have you trained up the boys in the warehouse to give you a kind of yeah, so I think yeah. that? Um, the boys in the warehouse certainly do a bit of that. Um, you know, it, it could just be, you know, they'll, <laughs> I mean, I suppose it's how I kind of started as well. That and I, I've said to the guys, you know, you, you've got to taste, you've got to, you know, pay attention to what it is you're doing so that you can, you know, develop and, and learn and, and be um, kind of better at what you do. It's what I did when, when Jim was teaching me things. He would, you know, have a glass, taste that, you know, dip your finger in, have a taste, look at it, the colour, look at the cask, you know, and you build up a knowledge. And I think the good thing is the boys are all really interested in what it is they do. So naturally it happens, they want to know more. So I'm sure Jay doesn't take much convincing. No, to no, 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 absolutely <laughs> not. No, it's, it's, it's pint glass that he has there for Especially sampling. Right? Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. Um, <laughs> two, two slightly juicy ones, maybe, to finish. Um, a couple of questions on when we're going to see a Port Charlotte Black Art. A Port Charlotte Black Art? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think <laughs> we've done, I think I'm sure I did one at the, the master class a couple of years ago was a Port Charlotte Black Art, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. So in the background, yeah, we're thinking about these kind of things and have something yeah, on the go. Yeah, if you're in Adam's sample room, it's Port Charlotte <laughs> Black Art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But um, so uh, okay, at the moment, I think Port Charlotte's an interesting thing because it's... Um, you know, it's a beautiful spirit and we're kind of developing it. We're still a young single malt. We're still looking at what we do. So maybe in the future one day, but at the moment, we'll kind of stick to what we're doing, I think. Oh. And um, again, so somebody asked us a really good question. I forget who you are, so sorry, I can't give you credit, but we'll retweet it later. Um, what's your favourite Port Charlotte that you've been involved in making? And is it the MRC? The one. <laughs> 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 uh, the MRC01 is a is an amazing whiskey, really, really interesting whiskey, and um, you know, I've been tasting that at kind of festivals and stuff with, with people that are out and about, and get, you know, some really, really lovely comments back about it. But for me, the best of the Port Charlotte is this uh, ten-year-old, because obviously, with give, with kind of rejuvenating Port Charlotte, if that's not even the right word, but in in kind of developing Port Charlotte again. We did have a multi vintage, Port Charlotte uh, Scottish Barley, which was a really, really good expression, a beautiful expression. Um, you know, there's a lot of variety and they're able to play a lot of tunes with the different casts and different vintages there. But watching Port Charlotte develop over the years, I've, I've kind of felt that as it's a kind of 10 years old, we start to just hit this amazing peak and being able to kind of write, what should we do with Port Charlotte? What do you want to do with the liquid? Having that free reign to go and choose something and then develop the 10. Um, you know, it's we don't have a lot of it, so it's not as if you know, you know we can sell it all over the place. It's quite limited. Um, but again, that was quite nice for me to be able to say, look, that's the that's the whiskey I want to release. That's what yeah. I believe, and that's what I think is the right balance of flavour. And then that's what we do. You know, there's no pressure to to do anything kind of commercially that will sell more whiskey. It's about really making the best whiskey we can because ultimately that's what represents us and what we do. So. Creating that was, was a, a fantastic um, kind of opportunity for me, and so I, I have a, a really nice connection to it, a personal connection to it, and I just I just love it as a as a drink. I think that's the best. Um, I suppose we can say about it is that you know we make whiskey that is something we absolutely enjoy drinking. You know, it's mm. delicious. It's amazing whiskey. So let's do it. I I know that nobody asked for my opinion, <laughs> but I'm going <laughs> to give it anyway. <laughs> um, but I find that with the current Port Charlotte range, um, the 10, the Isle of Barley, and the, the cask specials mm. that we've got, it's just the versatility with each of them that I find quite impressive. Like, I do enjoy each of them individually, but it's the fact that, you know, obviously that's how we've done it, but yeah. you want to showcase the differences. But it is about, you know, they're all very enjoyable for very different reasons. Yeah. It's not yeah, m yeah. monotonous, it's not standard, it's just like, well, this evening I feel like this, or this evening I feel like this. Yeah. 
So yeah, yeah there's a, there's definitely a, a versatility to Port Charlotte that's quite stunning. Absolutely, I think with with the range we've got there, there's there's a there's different conversations you can have, different moods you can you can um, kind of get into with these different whiskies. I think that's again it's the versatility of it because we're still exploring the spirit, it's still developing, and the cask specials. You know, maybe to touch back on the black art question. The cast specials are fantastic because you get to play amazing tunes with these casts and see how they develop, and then maybe that informs you in the years to come of which casks you'd use to make a black art. You know, mm. who knows? Maybe one day. Maybe one maybe day. One. Yeah. There's a. We'll just mention there's a few people who are tuning in around the world that I think deserve a little mention. So. Um, the Water of Life team are in the Edit Suite in Nepal, so I'm not oh sure wow. what. Uh, no, not um, in Nepal. Oh, does not say Nepal? <laughs> yeah. I not thought it said Nepal. Nepal. There's someone else in Nepal. Oh, sorry. <laughs> not uh, in Nepal. Um, do you want to there try? There can you say? Can you can you pronounce uh, <laughs> that name? Guavgurung. You're you're in Nepal. <laughs> the Water of Life people. You're definitely not in Nepal. But thanks, anyway, you're 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 somewhere in the United States. Ever. I think. <laughs> from the so uh, oh. so yeah, I mean it's late. <laughs> So We've got someone from Nepal tuning in. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank that is dedication. I imagine it's quite mm -hmm. late for you. I don't think his name is Paul, but he's uh, in Nepal. Uh, thanks to you for tuning in. Uh, o Ochi, that's probably pronounced wrong as well, in Japan. Uh, and Trent, uh, Trent, our very own Trent Simpson and his uh, team in uh, San Francisco. So uh, thank you to you guys as well. Well done, team. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. Um, Someone's listening to someone us. Someone is. <laughs> yeah. Well done for staying up, Trent, or getting up early, or whatever time of day <laughs> it is over there. Yeah. Okay. Come on now, you're a world traveller now. Yeah, I get I get lost going home. So. Your holiday to Port Haven each year. <laughs> exactly, exotic travel. Um, <laughs> good. So, any we we got some good questions? Are we. Uh, yeah, oh, we can stay here all night and ask questions if you well want. Let's you pick, pick one more good one, Rab, right, and one then more, we'll one better let everyone one, get okay, to bed. I'll go into J Jane sent me a few here, so I'm going to pick one of Jane. So if it's rubbish, she can take the blame for it. Uh, just speak among yourselves. Oh, yes, okay, I really, I really like this one. Sorry, don't speak among yourselves. So um, uh, I think it's J Rose with a five instead of an S. Uh, will we see a micro provenance series in the future? But experimenting with different spirit cu spirit cuts or fermentation methods or other parts of the production process as opposed to just cask and peeping milk. That's a very interesting question. Um, I think, well, do you know, I mean, it's it's something with the MPs that we you know we're kind of oh, we haven't done one for a, for a while as obviously we, we talked about at the beginning. Um, but I think you know it's a great tool to be able to discuss lots of different things. So maybe you know we could look at. You know, putting a vote out for what we'll do for the next one, or a topic yeah. to to cover for the next one, because, I mean, the good thing about what we do at Brickland is there's nothing to hide. We're going to talk about anything. You know, this hour's tasting, which has gone on for about three hours now, <laughs> um, you know, we've, we've got a lot to talk about, and we're open and we're transparent. So I think maybe so we could do something like that, where if there's a particular topic, um, you know, everybody wants to discuss or talk about or raise, then we could maybe do yeah. that for a for a crowdsourced MP. Yeah. If anyone does want to suggest, you can do it on our social media channels. Mm -hmm. Or also, if you write to newsroom at brickladdy.com, we'll collate some feedback and we'll take your notes yeah. on board for the next thing. time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Brilliant. Should we wrap let's up? Let's do that. Well, do you want to pick a favourite? Or um, I, th I can't. I can't. It's like picking your favourite child, you know. Oh, surely you have one. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. No. I love my children both <laughs> equally. Um, uh, so. <laughs> I think um, to pick a favourite of those three, I don't think would be fair. I think they're all completely individual whiskies. They both express, or they all express certain individual characteristics. Um, I think that's the lovely thing about what we're able to do. Mm. Nice. Um, so, Christy, thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Robert, Jane, thank you very much indeed. And thank you to where uh, else we'd rather be on a Friday evening? I can't think of anywhere else. Certainly yeah. don't have a life. I'd rather be here. Exactly. <laughs> me too. Me too. Um, so, uh, well, listen, thank you everybody for um, spending time with us and sending in questions. And hopefully you've managed to stay to the end of this. You know, everyone who started is still with us now. Um, until the next one. Cheers. Slange. Cheers.